Hey everybody, welcome to the live show. Glad you're with us. Just want to let you know that next week is just a reminder. It's Mother's Day next week, so no live show next week. Uh, just so you're aware. We have a lot of pictures to go through here in just a second. So thanks to everybody who sent in pictures. So next week, no live show. Um, just want to let you know what's coming up on the channel this week. We're doing a Kia Sportage and a Hyundai Tucson comparison. Uh, that's going to be coming out on Tuesday. On Wednesday, it's the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the uh, GT Performance model. <coughs> Excuse me, 600 plus pound-feet of torque. This thing is fast. And then on uh, Saturday, uh, we're taking off to um, uh, Niagara on the Lake this week. And we're going to be driving the Jetta and the GLI, and we're going to have a video on one of the Volkswagens coming out on Saturday. All right. Uh, don't forget, CanadaDrives.ca is if you're looking for a used car, you can go online and shop for the car. You can look around, do all of the browsing. You can select the car, get qualified for the payments, and even have the vehicle delivered to you the next day in a covered trailer and it's all done online so it's canadadrives.ca that's for used for new it's carcostcanada.com and that's where you get the dealer's cost for any car you're looking for that's pretty powerful information you're shopping for a car you want to know what the dealer paid for that car and then you negotiate off that price and hopefully you'll get a better deal and we all need help these days all right so um yeah, we're going to get to our questions in just a second. I just want to start off by doing some pictures. If you want to get a picture of your ride on, it's Zach at Motormouth.ca, Z-A-C-K at Motormouth.ca, or Z-A-C-K at Motormouth.ca if you want to get it through for next week. The first one is, now Raj sent this last week, but he got it in just a little bit too late. So here's Raj and his new whip. Isn't that beautiful? That is a GT4 with a special uh, paint coat code he just picked that up and Raj has been on uh, the live show here for quite a long time um, asking questions the next one is Jeff just sent in a picture of his new BMW X5 40e so that's the plug-in hybrid version uh, the next picture goes to Juan who sent in a picture of his uh, carbon edition Mazda 3 or Mazda 3 south of the border uh, so nice looking car uh, then our next one goes to uh, Min I, I think is how you say the name M-I-N-H Ming or Min uh, I think that's a great shot that is uh, his G70 done in the snow that looks really good with the red um, our next picture is is Amr sent in his Mirage 5 speed he said he's been driving mini minis and fun to drive little cars and he said he's going to basic transportation the funny thing is Andrew and I were driving behind this exact same car not this car but the exact same uh, configuration as this just the other day and I said to Andrea that's kind of a neat color of white it's got quite a bit of gray in it so uh, that is cheap sensible transportation right now especially with the cost of gas and then our next picture uh, this is uh, a beauty from Bruno his Civic Type R in Boost Blue, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, then we go to the next one. This is quite the double combo. This is from George. He's got a Porsche Panamera Sport Turismo and a Macan GTS. Now he's living large. Uh, well done. A couple of beauties there. It's good to have two Porsches, isn't it? Uh, then the next one is, uh, this one was sent by uh, Roman uh, from Ottawa. <coughs> he spotted this, um, I guess you'd call it an art car. It's got shells that are glued all over it. I'm not sure what's on the roof. They look like little lanterns, but but anyway, that's, that's quite the uh, work of art. Uh, yeah, a few more to go here. This one uh, is from Jay. And he says, this car still turns heads. It's a 2003 Audi A4 1.8T. That looks like a really clean car. Almost 20 years old now. Uh, the next picture comes from our good friend, um, Scott, who always sends in a picture each week of his Mustang GT. And he just went on a 700-mile road trip from uh, Asheville, North Carolina, through the Blue Ridge Parkway. And I was lucky enough uh, several years ago to do that run through that part of the United States, the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Smoky Mountains, and man, amazing roads and beautiful countryside. 
So that's that one. And uh, do we have one more? Yep. And here's uh, Harpreet, who just picked up with his family their new Palisade uh, that they got, I think, on Friday. And uh, yeah, there you go. Excited about the new whip. Okay, so we have questions to get to. First of all, we're going to do a video question. Alex, if uh, he's the only one that sends in video questions, you can send a video question through to Zach at motormouth.ca as well. So here's Alex and his question for today. Hey, Zach. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you for the addition of the Newton Mrs. and the latest series video. Appreciate that. And second, my question for today is why the car makers, especially electric car makers, Focus on the range and not in an energy consumption. Like I can put a 100 liters uh, fuel tank in a Camaro V8 and say I get 600 miles of range, but my consumption is 18 liters, 18 liters per 100 kilometers or 15 miles per gallon. I think it's going to be better to focus in on the energy consumption and nobody say how much energy consumption each electric car. Thank you. So it is a, a good question and it's something that we kind of struggle with on how to talk about the efficiency of electric cars. So the official way that it's done, for example, um, we do in Canada uh, liters per 100 kilometers for fuel efficiency. In the United States, of course, it's miles per gallon. But the official fuel economy ratings for the EPA in the States and here in Canada is liters equivalent. And in the United States, it's miles per gallon equivalent. And nobody understands what that is or even how to calculate it. The way that people in the in the electric car world calculate fuel economy is through efficiency, which is exactly what you're talking about. And the way they do it is how many kilowatts have you used for every 100 kilometers driven? So we'll pick a nice easy one, okay? Um, say your car has a 75 kilowatt battery, 75 kilowatt hour battery, and you're driving and using 25 uh, kilowatts for every 100 kilometers you drive, that means you're gonna get 300, if you divide 25 into 75, that goes three times, uh, you're gonna get 300 kilometers of range out of that battery. That's kinda of how it works. So how many kilowatts do you use over 100 kilometers? And I think that uh, inside the EV world where everybody posts online about their range and what kind of fuel economy relatively they're getting, that's kinda of how they do it. I uh, just wanted to let you know that um, if you have to, have to, have to get a question answered, you can always do a super chat. It kind of flags it for me and it's easier for me to see. All right, let's get into the questions. This one uh, comes from Sam. I haven't seen any of these yet. Hey, Zach, just graduated from university. I'd like to treat myself with an Audi A3S line, but I don't think uh, it would be a good financial decision for my future. Uh, see next. Uh, I'm also considering more rational model like a Jetta, Honda, uh, Civic Touring, or a Mazda 3. Looking for a fun to drive car with decent fuel economy, all wheel drive is a plus. What are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, if you're just coming out of university and typically you're starting with a new job, the good thing is the, the market for people coming out of school and going to the workplace is uh, quite strong. Um, but you really have to crunch the numbers. And one way to do it, I think you said you're gonna lease it, uh, lease it, yeah, is to crunch the numbers. You might be surprised that the Audi, because it maybe has a higher residual value, I don't know, I haven't looked it up, uh, the, might, the difference might not be that much to go from, say, like a, a Civic Si. Now, if you're, if you're thinking about getting an Audi or doing something fun like that, have you thought about doing a manual transmission? because <clears throat> you could get like a Civic Si manual transmission. You could get the new Acura Integra manual transmission, which might be a little bit more fun, and you don't have to go for that prestige brand. The other thing to remember with an A3 is it really is just a Volkswagen Golf, right? So here's the other thing. You can go and get a Volkswagen Golf GTI, base model with manual transmission is thirty one and a half thousand dollars that's a lot of car for the money but um but sam also watch this uh next coming saturday this coming saturday because we're going to be doing a review on the updated jetta okay so stick around for that and we might have some things to say we haven't driven it yet but we'll we'll find out but you know really think long and hard about getting stuck into a long lease or something 
for three or four years and you know hopefully your financial situation is going to stay the same uh, but really really think it through we've already got a super chat on the board here I love it I don't have a question just wanted to say you're both doing a great job greetings from Berlin Germany awesome you know, all the time, I think I've mentioned this before, all the times that I've been to Germany for car events with Porsche, with Volkswagen, with Audi, with Mercedes-Benz, I've never been to Berlin. I was invited to go to um, a Volkswagen Beetle event they had about 10 years ago, and it was going to be um, in Germany, um, in Berlin, and I couldn't go to that. I was really disappointed because I hear it's a really very cool city, real cool art scene, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, one day I'll get there. Um, but thank you very much. By the way, I don't know what it was. Um, two weeks ago, I really pushed to get the thumbs up going. And um, for whatever reason, the number of people that ended up watching this was much higher than it was, say, last week by a couple of thousand. So if you guys could smash the thumbs up, that would be great. I'll remind you again through, um, through the remainder of the show here. Oh, one. Uh, speaking of Germany, I just was on... I was just on uh, automotive news before we went on the air here. Uh, the German auto sector has taken it on the chin in the last six months or so. So first you have the chip shortage. Everybody was struggling to get chips for their cars. German car brands were suffering from that. Then the war breaks out in, um, in Ukraine and one of the largest wiring loom suppliers for a lot of the German brands is in Ukraine and it affected how many they could make and bring uh, across the border. So you've got that. And now Germany and the car industry is very worried because the Russians have cut off natural gas supply to Poland and Bulgaria as a stance against the um, allied, the rest of basically Europe going up against Russia. So the car industry is very worried that if Russia has some kind of sanctions against Germany when it comes to energy, what's that going to do for the biggest export industry they have, which is automotive? So we'll have to wait, um, see what happens there. All right. Here's Carter. Carter, nice to have you back this week. Traveling from Toronto to Vancouver this summer, I wanted to set your record, uh, recommendation on thrilling or scenic roads you won't otherwise see in TO. What are non-premium rental SUVs would you pick for the drive? Um, non-premium rental SUVs would you pick for the drive? I'm not sure what size of SUV that you're thinking of. If you're thinking of a mid-size SUV, um, hear me out here. The Dodge Durango is very comfortable and has really good handling. And that could go uh, in your favor if you're going to be driving um, through especially some of the British Columbia roads. When I moved here from Ontario years ago, I didn't actually drive through Canada because driving north of Toronto and then up through the lakehead of northern Ontario until you get to Manitoba, it takes like a day or two just to get out of Ontario. It's such a long drive. I actually drove down to um, Sarnia and then crossed into Michigan. I went under Lake Superior across the Northern Plains to Washington State and then came up that way. And I did that by myself in my old Toyota Celica or Celica south of the border in three days by myself. Now that was some crazy stuff to do when I was young, um, but I did it. What I would suggest is um, the road that you're going to drive to get out of Ontario is the Trans Canada. Not too much uh, spectacular around there. Then you get to the prairies and it's flat. And it really only gets interesting when you get to British Columbia. Now there's going to be some roads off there that I'm sure you could take through the foothills of Alberta. Some beautiful countryside there. Now, how you get from the Alberta border to Vancouver, you can go many different ways and see many beautiful parts of BC through the mountains and the lakes and all of that kind of stuff. The one I would consider is is getting to um, is was taking what's called the Duffy Lake Road, and it brings you from Lillooet through the high desert alpine down behind Whistler Blackcomb. You come in the backside of that, and then you arrive in uh, through Whistler from the north, and that has got to be one of the most beautiful drives you'll ever do. So yeah, if uh, if there's a Dodge Durango that they have. That would be a good car for a long road trip, I think. Uh, 
Uh, Harley saying, hey, Zach, do you have any knowledge, opinion on the VinFast VF8? I don't have any firsthand knowledge. We uh, had some colleagues that went to Vietnam and had this huge tour of everything, um, uh, Vin, you know, automotive and uh, the big company that it is, even have like a Disneyland there. And um, um, so it's going to be a subscription model. So you're going to buy the car and then you subscribe to get the battery. I think the subscription is like $50 a month or something like that. I have to find out more about it. They're going to be doing a tour across the country, just so you're aware. They're going to do, be doing stops all the way across in major metropolitan areas across the country starting in the next month or so. So, so go onto their website, find out when that's going to be, and then maybe go down uh, and have a look at the cars when they're touring across the country. Hey, Zach, how do the audio systems in the Genesis G70 compare to the Germans? Heard a lot of good things about B&O and Audi and Harman Kardon and Mercedes. Burmester is also another one that's sold uh, in Mercedes-Benz and in Porsche products, two I can remember. Um, audio is such a sort of... Um, a particular thing right because what I like in an audio system isn't going to be what you like for example I'm speaking of Volkswagen and we're going to drive the Jetta uh, this week so Volkswagen is a kind of an odd company in that they have uh, Harman Kardon uh, that produces uh, up uprated stereo say for the uh, Tiguan they have Beats that supplies the audio for the Jetta. And then they have Fender that supplies audio for a lot of the other cars. And the Fender one, by the way, is fantastic. In my opinion, that's the best non-premium stereo in a car is the Volkswagen Fender system. So clean, so so crisp. So it really is, is a personal, to be honest with you, it's been, a, it's been a, a little while since I've driven a Genesis. I had no issue with it. I can't really say compared to the others, you'd have to go back and forth. What I suggest you do is if you get a chance to get in these is have sort of like what I would call reference tracks like a like a song you know really well that you've heard on other different stereos and see how it handles what you're looking for like you might be really into hip-hop uh, and like bass or you might be into classical and like the high ends I don't know all right um MJ says, hey, need a bit of help. Uh, Sportage SX8 um, hybrid electric and a Santa Fe uh, luxury hybrid cost is very similar. Uh, th thoughts for against either model uh, for your pick. Um, so these are both really nice, actually. The the Sportage video, uh, there's, there's the Sportage right there. Um, that went out last Saturday, and uh, I really liked it. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, the, the, the hybrid electric versions are arriving at dealers now. So the Santa Fe is going to be a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier. It is a slightly bigger vehicle. It comes down to really, if you want that traditional SUV kind of look on the outside and the inside, uh, the Santa Fe is going to have that with a more conventional kind of center cluster with all the buttons. And uh, then when you get the Sportage, you have sort of a cleaner look to it. Um, they're both using the same platform basically and the same engine transmission setup. So it comes down to basically the features and the taste for your personal needs. So they're really, I don't think there's a bad answer for either of them. It really comes down to what you think of each one. Uh, another one here, uh, he's saying, also because of the increased EV rebate, Hyundai, Kia, PHEVs cost the same, cheaper than the uh, hybrid um, counterparts. Thoughts? Any point going for a PHEV without a charging spot at a condo? Um, yeah, I mean, listen, if you don't have a place to plug in, a plug-in, really unless you have one at work for example when you get to work if you're working still from home that's not going to work um i think a, ba a battery hybrid vehicle for people who live in apartments don't have a chance to plug in you're going to average down your fuel costs quickly and it's not a big barrier to get um to get one over a regular gas model to your point because of the rebate yeah but one thing i want to let you uh, know about um because of the rebate, yes, you're saying that the price is going to come down and it makes it comparable to just the regular hybrid. 
The problem is you're not going to be able to get one unless you have some magic dust that you can get one ordered. If you can get a plug-in, I think it would be the smart way to go when you calculate the rebate and you get increased fuel economy, but you got nowhere to plug it in. So you really got to think long and hard if you live in an apartment or a condo, if you can't plug it in, there's really no upside to that. It's really frustrating. Trust me, we had two electric cars last week. We had the... Um, the i4 and then the Mach-E and we don't have a 240 volt charger because this house that I'm in is a hundred years old we have attached garage at the end of our back uh, yard and then a laneway so I have to get an electrician to come in and put a line all the way out there and all that kind of stuff it's not going to be cheap or easy to do so I have to go to the charging infrastructure near where I am um, and it's a pain in the ass to sit there and wait for it to charge. I wouldn't want to do that all the time. I want to be able to plug it in and actually uh, use it uh, or get the fuel basically while I'm sleeping. Here's another super chat. I don't have a question. Just wanted to say, oh, we already did that one. Thank you. That's from Berlin, Germany. There's another one here, another super chat, I think. I think another one came in. Here it goes from Scott. Cross shopping, Q5, GLC, GV70, Volvo XC60, then came across the Lincoln Nautilus. Uh, you've never reviewed Nautilus and curious why not. Badge prestige, not huge for me. Uh, want best bang for the buck. Um, I believe there is a Nautilus video on the channel that Mike Gurr did um a couple of years ago so there is one on the channel that is not one that andrew and i have done together um but yes you're right i uh because i haven't driven in a while i don't know the pricing of that off the top of my head but yeah the one thing you've got to remember what's the most expensive thing about owning a car what's the most expensive thing about owning a car by the way fuel isn't even close to being the say the top three the most expensive thing about owning a car is depreciation, residual value. What's it going to be worth after three, four, five years? And unfortunately for, for Lincoln, um, they're just not a brand that people are seeking out. I mean, their sales are pretty pathetic. And if you're going to have a car to sell in four or five years, would you rather have something from a brand that actually is easy to sell and has good resale value? So I'm not saying it has terrible resale value. It's just something you should look into before you put your money down and drive a Lincoln. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the way a Lincoln calibrates its suspension. I prefer um, Cadillac, I think, does a better job. But there you go. Um, I reckon the XC60 won't be homologated for the North American market. They have clearly stated that that is not a North American product. So we get the XC50, we're going to get the XC90, which is going to be the CX9 replacement later this year, and the, that car is not coming our way. Here's Daniel. Hey, Daniel, you look very happy with the room of the new Sportage second row seats. Laugh out loud. Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice size vehicle. Both the Tucson and the Sportage have a lot of room inside the back seat in the cargo area. By the way, this week on Tuesday, we're going to have a comparison with those two products. Um... Sam is asking, uh, hey, Zach, I read BC has a law, no ice sales by 2030. Enjoy the next years of ice reviews, I guess. You know, it's easy to say that. Listen, it's easy for governments to say, oh, we're just going to ban anything that's internal combustion engine. Uh, it's a whole different story to actually replace, you know, the millions of cars that are being sold every year by something other um, than internal combustion engines. The hard reality is that about 4% of vehicles sold in Canada right now are, are electric or plug-in. Um, that leaves 96% of all the vehicles that are sold right now conventional gas. Now that's changing and a big part of it also is because of fuel economy. You can't get them. Car manufacturers are not able to supply them. So um, yeah, eight years is a long time. But um, I don't think it's going to be as easy as all that just to replace all of the cars that are on the road now. By the way, it doesn't say you're not going to be able to drive your gas car. There's going to be a whole lot of people that keep and hold their existing gasoline cars and will continue to drive them. 
Because a lot of people don't realize the vast majority, like here's the one I always say, what do you think the average age of a car on the road is? The average age of a car on the road right now is nine to 10 years old. So if you had 100% electric car sales in 2030, it would take nine or 10 years for all of those existing cars on the road to be replaced by those new electric ones. I just don't see it um, happening as easily as everybody says. In addition, electric vehicles right now and for the foreseeable future are going to be a plaything of the upper middle class. A lot of baby boomers are buying electric cars because they have disposable income. These cars are expensive. We get to test drive all of the cars, uh, the small SUVs that are for sale. That's what people want. They want a small SUV that's electrified. They all start at $45,000. So what did the government do? They jacked up the e-rebate from 40, starting at $45,000 for an SUV, now starting at 60. Is there going to be an incentive for these car companies to bring in those less expensive uh, $45,000 EVs? No. They're going to bring in, I bet you they're all going to start around $50,000, $55,000. That, my friend, is not the meat of the market. The meat of the market is still the RAV4, CRV, uh, Sportage, gas model, um, you know, all of the cars that are basically $35,000 to $40,000. We do not have EVs in numbers to replace all of those most popular models. And, and then you have every single car manufacturer on the planet chasing the same uh, rare materials. So nickel and lithium and all of these materials, they're all fighting for them. So what's happened now? The prices of that have gone up, which means there's going to be upward pressure on electric cars, not downward pressure. And everybody says, oh, they're going to be able to make the batteries a lot cheaper. No, because if the input costs go up, which is already happening, then the price of the batteries is going to be more expensive. So it's easy to say, oh yeah, you are going to be driving electric cars in the next eight years. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. It could happen. It might it might go perfectly smoothly, but I just don't think when governments get involved, that ever happens. Level 70. Hey, Zach, if you were in the market for a new car today and were concerned about its future trade value, would you buy a gas-only hybrid or EV today? Well, this kind of dovetails into the last uh, point that someone was making. I get this all the time. People say to me, oh, why would you buy a gas car? It's going to be obsolete in three years. To all the points I just mentioned, l listen, if, if, if you could, what I've said before is if you can go into a Honda dealer and they have a CRV that's $35,000, and right next to it is the electric version, and it's five or six grand more, you got a real compelling story. But you're going to have a $35,000 CRV, and then the full electric one, if and when it comes, it is going to be coming in the next few years, um, built with General Motors called the Prologue. It's going to be like all of these other ones. They're all going to be like fifty-five or sixty thousand dollars. That's not the meat of the market. The meat of the market is thirty to forty thousand dollars. So, like I said, it's easy to say that we're all going to drive electric cars, but who's paying for it? And then you get the government saying, oh, we'll give everybody money. That's a great idea. Um, all right. If you guys want to get a super chat, that would be great. By the way, we have uh, 350 people on board and 117 thumbs up. If you guys could smash the thumbs up, that would be great. That really does help. I'm going to figure out where it was before. MJ. Um, is there any direct competitor from Mercedes to 4 Series Grand Coupe? Not really. Um, no, they don't have a lift back car. They, you know, they don't, they don't have, no, there's nothing really from them. I guess there was the, uh, the CLA. Um, but that would compete more with the 2 Series Grand Coupe. Then you would have the C-Class. Um, no, there isn't really anything. C-Class, I guess. That would be the closest. Or C-Class Wagon. Have you heard any news, uh, any new Honda CRV, and if they're going to bring the hybrid model to Canada? Yes, the CRV is going into production this fall in Canada. It's going to be made here. The gas, I mean, they've been making the CRV here for many, many years. 
But what the big announcement was is they're adding uh, hybridization, electrification to that assembly line in Ontario. So the models that we're going to get in Canada finally are going to be coming um, from that facility. So yeah, it's going to happen. It'll be later this year. Probably towards the end of the year. Big fan of the show. Since the Toyota GR Corolla came out with all-wheel drive, do you think that the Honda Civic Type R will go to the same platform? Well, they're two different companies. One is Honda and one's Toyota. But, um, um, yeah, wouldn't it be fun if you could actually get an all-wheel drive Civic? Um, that would be a hell of a lot of car, especially for the for the Type R. I don't have any in, 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 uh, information on that, but it would be fun. Ricardo Gill, hey Zach, what is the best track you've ever driven? Greetings from Lima Pro. This is a very good question. Um, I've been on lots of racetracks. Uh, favorite track? Um, I got to drive just before COVID hit. They had a Porsche, Boxster, and Cayman event, and that was at the Estoril racetrack in Portugal. They used to have the Estoril or the Portuguese Grand Prix there years ago. That was a lot of fun. I got to go at a, um, a Mercedes a GT, a Mercedes GT, the big two-door, the big long hood. Uh, got to drive at another Formula One racetrack, Hockenheim. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the only problem with that is it was raining a lot that day, so it was very wet. We didn't get to exercise the car as much as we'd like, so that was really cool. I've never done the Nürburgring. I keep on hoping to get to there. Um, uh, some tracks in Canada. I like most sports a load of fun, or Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. Um, Calabogie is a great track uh, near Ottawa. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of... Oh, um, um, what's the one down in uh, Barber Motorsports Park? which is where Porsche used to have their Porsche driving experience. Uh, Barber Motorsports Park is actually a motorcycle racetrack that was built for motorbikes, and it is absolutely beautiful. Now, there's quite a lot that I've been to that are fun. Here's Sam saying, I read there aren't enough raw materials forecast for half the battery electric vehicles worldwide. They want to sell by 2030. What I just said, exactly. Kenneth, hey Zach, love watching your show. Would you recommend paint protection film or alternative options? Thanks. Um, I would I would suggest paint protection film for if you're if you're driving a lot on the highway, if you're trailering, especially a vehicle behind a, a, a trailer like um, a motorhome. Um, or if you live somewhere where you get a lot of stone chips, say in parts of um, Alberta and the prairies where they put down all that grit in the winter, they don't put, they do now put salt in, but a lot of areas they just put down sand and grit and these, this, the front of your car just gets beaten to crap. So that is an area where I would put protective film on the front of the car. Um, but, um, you know, if you're just driving in a major metropolitan area, I don't think you really need to go crazy on it. Plus, you know, it has a lifespan. It has to be replaced after a certain amount of time. So, yeah, it depends, it depends on what kind of driving you're doing. JD uh, took my 11 CRV EXL in for service the other day, and the dealer wanted to buy it. Uh, I bought new from same BC dealer in 2012, original owner, 250,000 kilometers. Bizarre. They have no cars to sell. I don't know if you looked around the lot. They have no cars. So these car dealers are dying for good used vehicles. You'd be shocked by what they pay you for that car. So yeah, good for you. That was um, 2011. That was still the six-speed automatic, I think, or five-speed automatic. That was a, that era of CRV was particularly good. Do you know the wait time for the RAV4 uh, hybrid is now 18 plus months? Um, we were with Toyota a couple of weeks ago for their electric car launch in Victoria and we asked about this and the answer was quite interesting. They said the higher volume dealerships will get more cars obviously because if you have a, so the way car companies work is if you're a high volume dealer, you get more volume the next year. So dealerships that are very big and, and have a, a lot of repeat customers will get more cars. So if you're on a list, sure, the list is longer, but they get more cars delivered to them. Meanwhile, if you're at a small dealership in a small town, they're not going to get a lot of allocation of cars. So sometimes it's better to go and maybe order a car from a bigger dealer, hoping that they're going to be able to fulfill the order. That was a pretty interesting answer I got from them. 
Um, <laughs> Julie's saying, would you ever think about reviewing the Mitsubishi Mirage? Thanks for all the reviews. There is a video of the Mirage on the channel I did by myself a few years ago, but it's the car hasn't changed, so the video is there. You can have a look. Dave in Canada, I'm looking at Michelin Defender uh, LTX or ITX for RAV4. I don't, I'm not familiar with that particular tire. Whenever you're buying tires for a car, it is always, in my opinion, a good idea to go with good, uh, reputable companies because the big companies like Michelin, like uh, Pirelli or um, uh, Bridgestone or any of the big uh, tire companies, and there's some secondary brands like like Toyo and Yokohama and so on, Hankook, um, Nitto, and those those names you've heard before. They spend so much more in research and development in their tires. So I'm not sure about that tire specifically for a Rav4. You know, a great place to buy tires is Costco. Costco is a great place, and they they do a lot of um, you know research into what. Uh, tires they sell for all those mainline cars I talked about what average people buy um, so yeah um, why not Michelin's a, an excellent uh, brand so why wouldn't you hey Zach in the market for a new compact hybrid SUV do you think the Hyundai Santa Fe is better than the Venza or the other way around any updates on the CX-50 hybrid I'll do the last part first CX-50 hybrid is, is apparently going to be coming this fall Probably, um, yeah, we're going to have to wait until they get an announcement. But it is coming. So the good news is you know it is coming. I like the look of that car, and the fact it's going to be hybridized I think is great. Now, the other part is which do you like better, the Santa Fe or uh, the Venza? I personally would take the Santa Fe just because I like the interior better. I think that the, the Venza has got this awkward, kind of clumsy, cobbled together interior that I don't particularly like, but you're the one that has to drive it. So check it out. It's interesting because um, we drove the Venza when it first came out a couple of years ago. I just emailed Toyota Canada and I got a booking and we're gonna get the Venza back because it's been two years since we drove it and I think it's worth revisiting. So if you're not in a rush, in a few weeks, we're gonna do the Venza again. It's towards the end of uh, this month, May. We'll get the car back and do it again. But for me personally, Santa Fe, also, there's no um, continuously variable transmission in the Hyundai product. It's a turbo 1.6 four-cylinder and the electric motor and a regular conventional six-speed automatic. So it has more of a conventional drive compared to the Toyotas. 2023 BMW i7 EV better than Rolls-Royce. I don't know. I haven't seen one yet. I've only seen pictures of it. Uh, put down for a uh, GT2 EV6. Let's hope it's here before 2024. Uh, which midsize three-row SUV offers second-row captain's chairs and has the best handling on the road? In my opinion, the best handling SUV in the three-row midsize class is the Dodge Durango. I think it's a, a wonderful product. It has captain's chairs, and I... I like it a lot. You know, we also drove the um, Chevy um, Traverse recently. Uh, the video is in the computer here. It'll be coming out. I'm not sure exactly when, but that I actually like driving. It was quite nice to drive. But if you're just going for pure best handling, I would say that the Dodge Durango, because it's built on the old Mercedes-Benz platform. If you're not aware, you might remember that uh, Dodge and uh, Mercedes-Benz and Chrysler used to be one company about 20 years ago and then when they divorced um, uh, Jeep made the Grand Cherokee out of a Mercedes-Benz platform and then that was spun into the Durango so the Durango has this older Mercedes-Benz platform but it handles incredibly well it's it's got amazing um, um, dependability scores like you go look up the JD power numbers for the Dodge Durango the quality scores on it are better than pretty much anything out there so I'm a big fan of that so that's the honest answer. You might want me to pick a Japanese one, but in my opinion, the Durango is the best handling one. Uh, John saying, um, what's your question here, John? 
Uh, I was thinking about getting an Accord Hybrid in the near future until I heard there is a problem with lots of road noise which irritates me when I'm driving my 19 Civic. Your thoughts? Now, this the 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 hybrid Accord is 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 a bigger, more poised, and I would say uh, more insulated version than the Civic. Now, you're driving the old Civic. The new Civic is is better a, as well. I didn't. Uh, Andrea thought that there was some um, droning from the engine in the Accord Hybrid. I thought it was great. I thought the Accord Hybrid really surprised me and I liked it. So all I can say is try and get your hands on one and drive it and see for yourself. Don't always go by what other people say. Um, you have to really try these things for yourself. I thought it was fantastic. All right, we got a 400 plus people on board, 183 thumbs up. There's two thumbs down. That's all right. I got big shoulders. I can handle it. So if you guys could smash the thumbs up, we get it over 200. That'd be great. Uh, I don't know why. I, I don't know why the thumbs up helps, but it does. Thoughts on how long Porsche will continue to make the 718 Spider? Um, well, the next 718 is going to be electric, right? I'm not sure if you know that. So when it comes, it'll be an electrified version. That's when the Spider will probably be gone, or they might have an electrified Spider. Good for Canada. We can't sell more of our gas that U.S. I don't understand what that means. Uh, hi, Zach. Uh, do you know when the refreshed Telluride will be available in Canada? I think it's coming in the summer. Um, and pricing will be announced then as well. Uh, hey, Zach, I just wanted to get your opinion on the ICBC gas relief rebate of $110 and EV drivers get it too. My wife is a big follower of Andrea on Twitter. Can you give her a shout out? Thanks. Well, uh, Colleen, hello. And um, yeah, Andrea with her Instagram, she, you know, the channel, uh, typically car review channels, don't index particularly well for women um but our channel does a way better than um most youtube channels because of course andrea's on the channel and women are watching the videos because there's another woman doing the videos but her instagram uh, instagram is very popular with women and she does even better on instagram so that's good colleen that you uh, follow her there um so <laughs> So in the, where, I, where, where we live in the province of British Columbia, this is what they decided to do um, because everybody's complaining about high gas prices. So right next door to where we live in British Columbia and Alberta, they got rid of the fuel taxes and helped bring the cost of gasoline down. So what did they decide to do in British Columbia? They gave everybody that has a licensed car a $110 rebate, an insured car a $110 rebate. To um, John's point, even people who had electric cars get $110. Now, the politics behind this is suspect because every year over the last few years, we've been getting rebates from our insurance uh, company here in BC because they have um, a, a excess profits. So this is probably just a regular uh, rebate we were going to get anyway, packaged in, um, in the form of a gas rebate. But I think this is the stupidest thing. You're giving somebody $110. What the hell is that going to do for them, really? I mean, $110, $100 now is like a 20 used to be 20 years ago. It's not that much money in the grand scheme of things. Now, for some people, $100 is a huge amount of money. I get it. But for most people, $100 isn't going to change their life. What I would have liked to see them do is roll back um, some of the taxes that have been put on gasoline here over the last few years. Because this is the line I like to use. Alex Epstein um, came up with this and I follow him. He's a energy guy and you can go and uh, look up his name. Alex Epstein, he has a book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels and he makes some great uh, arguments. And what he says is when energy is expensive, everything is expensive. So every, the price of everything goes up when, when fuel costs go up. And that's what we're living with right now. So the, the, the tractor to get the stuff out of the field costs more to do that. The truck to deliver it to the warehouse, from the warehouse to the grocery store, all of that, all of that adds extra cost because it all runs on fuel. So as the cost of fuel goes up, 
everything goes up and we're seeing that at the grocery store so instead of giving hundred and ten dollars back to people who are licensed to have a car or have insured in British Columbia you're not helping to bring down the costs associated with moving goods around for people who can't afford a car so I can afford to not get a hundred and ten dollar rebate but there are people who are on the margins who take transit and don't have a car that would like to have all of their costs brought down and you do that by reducing the amount of uh, what the input cost of energy is so as energy prices go up everything goes up so why didn't they rebate the cost of the energy and that would have bring all of the prices down Ah, I feel so much better now. But anyway, that's the way they like to do it. And they and and then in, in Ontario, they get people um, rebates for their stickers that they put on their car, which was just political games trying to buy votes. I get it. Because there's an election coming up in June in Ontario. Um... Hey Zach, what's the difference between EPA and WLTP? So it's a test cycle that they use for, uh, EPA is the North American test cycle they use for fuel economy, and then kind of the rest of the world, uh, Europe and Asia use a different test cycle. So off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure how they come up with it, but it's a different way of calculating fuel economy. And you'll see with electric cars that the range that's, um, um, targeted for an electric car based on EPA testing is much more conservative than the uh, European standard is. Usually they add about another 100 kilometers of range or so on their European testing cycle. That's all it is. They have just a different way of doing their calibrations and uh, how different it is off the top of my head I couldn't tell you. Why no 330e reviews yet? Because we gotta get the car. If we don't have the car we can't do the review. Uh, looked at Hyundai website for the Palisade. They say around summer or fall this year, but wait times will definitely be much longer. Yeah, so it's supposed to come this summer. Summer is three months and it ends at the end of September. A lot of people have to think summer ends at Labor Day, but no, it's actually September 21st. So yeah, I mean, I, I would suspect it's probably going to be late summer, early fall as, it, as obviously a 2023 model year. Will you get the 2023 Super Manual to review? I'm sure we will at some point. Hey Zach, any idea when the North, uh, when the new GLC 300 will come to North America? Well, nobody has seen it yet. We're we're going to be um, getting our hands on a C-class sedan, and that's what the GLC is based on. So there's loads of spy shots on go on the internet. Uh, so the C-class comes first, then the GLC based off that C-class platform will come after. So my best guess is it's probably going to be next year sometime. Now, with all of the changes in the car industry, is it going to be at the beginning of 2023 or at the end? I'm not quite sure, but that's um, that's my best guess. Hey, Zach, I was wondering your view on rust-proofing EVs or hybrid with new cars. Is it necessary? If so, rust-proofers say, is it safe? But dealerships say... There's a risk to the battery. Well, I guess it depends on what kind of system you're using for rust proofing. Um, you got to remember that when you're rust proofing a car, it's the it's the panels. It's not you're not drilling into where the battery is. Usually, it's the doors and the trunk and the hood and all the areas where and wheel wells where the where the rust um, usually starts. Just because an electric vehicle doesn't mean it's not going to be susceptible to rust. If it's a steel body, it could still rust. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I can say other than that. I would probably, if you're going to do rust proofing, I would say that um, um, the best still in Canada are Crown and Rust Check. But I would check with them and see how they deal with electric cars. Stephen Hayzak, planning on getting an electrified car, would you get a Nero Hybrid or uh, for twenty-seven thousand, a plug-in for thirty-four, an EV for forty-four? Which would you get? Well, I'd wait till I get our hands on the new Nero. So the new Nero is coming. It was shown at the New York Auto Show just a few weeks ago. So that looks like the one that you want. I'll have to wait until until we get our hands on it. So I really can't say anything more than that. We got a super chat from John. I missed that one earlier. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. No question, but a super chat. Okay, let's go down to the bottom. I think we had another one come in. Uh, level 70. 
Hey Zach, a few manufacturers are moving to three-cylinder turbos. Should I be concerned about the long-term reliability of these engines? Well, I'm kind of in your camp. Well, speaking of, there's a Mini popped up. Um, Mini had a three-cylinder years ago, and three-cylinders have been around for a while. Um, so, like, listen, it, I could say, oh, look at the Ford um, um, one point. What was what was the size of the engine? 1.3, I believe. 1.3 liter four cylinder EcoBoost that was in the Ford Focus and the Fiesta to see what the reliability of that engine was. Uh, but that's not the same engine that's going to be in the Ford Escape. It's a 1.5 or any of these others. It's it's hard to really say. You know, you think about it, or the new Nissan, for example, with the Rogue. You know, you're asking a small engine to do a lot of work, especially in the Nissan Rogue. It's got a 1.5 liter three cylinder turbo with variable compression. There's a lot going on with that, right? Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with you. I think that, yeah, if you're worried about that, don't buy one. That's the answer I have for anybody who says, well, I'm really worried about buying this brand because I don't, because I'm not sure about the reliability. Well, don't buy it. Buy a brand you know has a uh, reputation and good reliability. So if that's the case and you're worried about a 1.3, uh, three cylinder, not a 1.3, a three cylinder turbo, then buy something else. Hey Zach, what's your take on Buick? It's number five in JD Power dependability score. It's equal to Mercedes and BMW in China. My friend got one recently and I was honestly impressed. Now, I have been talking about this for years, years, that People crap all over uh, domestic, the you know the Detroit Three, uh, for making crappy cars. I just referenced the Dodge Durango. Look up the quality scores of the Dodge Durango. Fantastic uh, reliability. And then you get to Buick. Buick has been above average and near the top of quality scores for like ten years. 10 years. People don't believe me. I tell this all the time. I said, you want to buy a really good used car? Buy a, buy a Buick. Nobody's thinking about Buick and they are incredibly reliable. To your point, they make them and they're huge in China. Buick is a massive brand in China. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where people just don't believe it. And you can tell them over and over and over that this this is a good car. It's got good reliability scores. And they go, oh, no, it's a it's a Chevy or it's a Buick or it's a Ford. It's crap. They're all crap. It's like, well, at what point do you start to believe them? So another video that's in the computer here is the Chevy Equinox. The Chevy Equinox is a, is a particular model that Chevrolet sells that is indexed way above the industry average when it comes to quality and reliability, like way higher than many of the other brands. But people just don't even think, they go, I'm not buying that. It's a Chevy. It's got to be a piece of crap. It's just not true. So um, there you go. I don't know what else to say about it. It's frustrating because people just don't believe you when you say it. And there's nothing you can say. Or then they say, oh, J.D. Power is a, is a pile of crap and nobody um, believes anything. It's like, no, that's just not how it works. They don't pay to get a better score. They just don't. Sorry guys, I gotta find out where I was. This is Harpreet. Harpreet saying, did you get my question on Instagram? No, Harpreet, they do the, you do the questions here, not on Instagram. Um, Hey, Zach, uh, saying hi from London, Ontario. Thoughts on the new Silverado ZR2? Mine is being built at the end of the month. Um, I'm not sure what I can say, but I haven't, I don't really know much about that truck, to be honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you. Hey, Zach, my daily commuter on, uh, in Ontario, do you think a BMW i4 rear wheel drive is good enough or the expensive all wheel drive is necessary? live uh never lived with a rear wheel drive in winter okay there's a whole generation of people that are driving now who never experienced what it was like to live with two-wheel drive cars so in the in the like all the way up until the middle of the 70s pretty much all cars were rear wheel drive all wheel drive was some crazy thing that was used on real off-road vehicles like jeeps right <coughs> 
And then because of fuel economy standards, then car companies went to front wheel drive platforms. Think about the very first Volkswagen Rabbit or the Golf, the Dodge Omni, all those cars that came in the, um, in the mid to late 70s and early 80s. So up until about 20 years ago, <coughs> most people, when you bought a car, it was two-wheel drive. German luxury cars, like a 3 Series or a 5 Series or a 7 Series, were rear-wheel drive. And most economy cars, like the Corolla, the Civic, the Sentra, and all that, were front-wheel. They still are. And we all got around fine in the winter. What has changed, though, is the uh, ad addition of uh, traction control, stability control and vastly improve winter tires <coughs> so you know i we had a seven we had we had loads of uh, bmws that were just rear-wheel drive we had a five series we had a six series a seven two seven series and we put winter tires on them and we were fine in the winter now granted i don't live in timmins ontario i live in vancouver but i did grow up in ontario driving two-wheel drive cars and you put good winter tires on them you're going to be just fine so the big thing about driving a two-wheel drive car in the winter is right here is how you drive it but you have traction control you have stability control and you have to invest in a good high quality set of winter tires and if you drive sensibly you'll be just fine in the winter i um no it's not the same as all-wheel drive but you're going to get where you need to go to be honest with you the example i use all the time is in Quebec, they, for up until the last few years, bought little cars in huge numbers. Think of the Toyota Yaris, the Nissan Micra, the Honda Fit, the Fiesta, all these little cars, immensely popular in Quebec. And a lot of them were manual transmissions, and some didn't even have traction and stability control. But the big difference there is they have a mandatory winter tire uh, program. You have to have winter tires on your car. And they all seem to get around in some crazy uh, deep snow, no problem. So it can be done. All right, I think we have another super chat here. Here's Dave. Hey, Dave, good to see you. Hey, Zach, hope you were well. Got a deposit down for a Sportage PHEV early in April. Looking forward to it. Sounds like a great car. Uh, yeah, so we, we only had a chance to drive the gas model. Uh, but yeah, it's a pretty slick machine. I mean, I, I you know, between the Tucson and um, the Sportage, I like uh, the Kia. I just think the interior is beautiful. So yeah, good for you. You future-proofed. Uh, you're going to have a car that uh, is going to be easy if you ever need to get rid of it uh, for many years to come. Here's Jerome. By the way, Jerome just got a new job. Um, uh, so congratulations to him. If uh, your money was on the table, XC40 Recharge or Audi e-tron, by the way, uh, the miserable hab season is finally over thank god yeah so the playoffs start this coming week i believe habs are not in it winnipeg's not in it vancouver's not in it uh but anyway there's still some canadian teams which is going to be good um i haven't driven the e-tron to be honest with you um and the xc40 recharge i'm going to be honest i'm not a huge fan of volvo cars it's just a personal thing there's something about them they just don't do anything for me I find their I find their suspension for my taste too soft. I don't like the seating position. You sit up too high. My head's up near the ceiling. Steering is too light. So these are all very personal things. So that's me. You might love it, um, um, but yeah. Now it now these qualify for rebates because they jacked up the uh, you know the incentive to capture more vehicles. So I haven't driven the Audi e-tron, but um, but there you go. And the, the range on the XC40 that we drove is rated at about 350 kilometers of range. We didn't get close to that. And so, I don't know. I mean, I like, I like Volvo cars. I love the design. I think they look good. Uh, there's a lot of things about them I do like. It just personally for me with that car, I just didn't love the way that it, uh, you know, it drove. It's just too soft for my taste. But you go and drive it and see what you think. All right, 400 and... 50 people on board now, uh, 270 thumbs up. If you guys could smash the thumbs up, that would be great. Um, all right, where were we here? Oh my goodness, we've already done an hour. 
That went quickly. Where did that go? All right. I just want to let you know. Um, so this week on Tuesday, it's going to be the uh, Kia Sportage up against the Hyundai Tucson. So that's our comparison that this week. And Andrew has been doing all the research on it. And there are some shocking surprises. Shocking about uh, the Hyundai. So stay tuned for that on Tuesday. Wednesday, it's the Ford Mustang Mach-E GT Performance. Holy crap, is this thing fast. And um, uh, we'll see if it changed my mind about the Mach-E. So that's coming out on Wednesday. And then we're, we're flying out to Toronto, uh, driving down to Niagara on the lake. And there's two Volkswagens that we're going to drive. The updated Jetta with the new turbo four-cylinder engine. It's gone from 1.4 liter to 1.5. The same four-cylinder turbo that's in the uh, Taos. And then uh, the GLI, which is basically the old GTI in the sedan, the Jetta. So uh, I'm not sure which one's going to go on Saturday. It'll be the GLI or the Jetta. Either way, there'll be a Volkswagen Jetta video coming this Saturday. And um, yeah, oh, we got over 300. Thumbs up. That's awesome, guys. Appreciate that. All right. Um, Zach at motormouth.ca. Z-A-C-K at motormouth.ca if you want to get a picture through. Or like Alex, get a video question in. But thanks to everybody that uh, took part today. We're all done. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. Don't forget that. It's Mother's Day next Sunday. So we will not be doing the live show next Sunday. So we'll catch up with you guys in a couple weeks. Take it easy.